how do you make comics without all the frustration, without feeling lousy and inadequate all the time? Join me, Jess Rolofson, and me, Tom Hart, on The Terrible Anvil. Each week, we build community and shift our mindset about what it means to make comics and art. We're working through the whole process, one piece at a time, turning our suffering and angst into fun and glee. Join us at sawcomics.org. All right, Jess. Hi. Well, I forgot hey, how we do this. Do we do intros right away or do we just say hi? I, I think we do intros, but I always forget how to do it. Okay. Well, you are at the Sequential Artist Workshop. Everybody listening or watching is at the Sequential Artist Workshop. Thank you for being here. Um, oh, I'm getting Mighty Network notifications. I thought I turned them off. Anyway, I'm Tom Hart, uh, one of the people. I'm Jess Rolison. Okay. And I wanted to say that we are both are. Eisner nominees, and there was something else I wanted to say, but I forgot what it was. Maybe it was that we both are, oh, the heck with it. We're both cartoonists who are trying to negotiate not giving up comics. <laughs> That's not really true, but but anyway. So we, this is the Terrible Anvil. This is episode three. The first, this the Terrible Anvil comes from the idea that how you get good at something and how you find your own voice is by deadlines and doing something um, repeatedly and doing something often and doing something with a deadline. Um, and so this podcast is made in that um, with that sensibility. Uh, the first two episodes were about, um, I, what were they about? Ideas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of like a preliminary, preliminary. Like what? What if? Right. Like uh, some about some about what ifs? What if this happens? What if that happens? And kind of this uh, uh, resistance that comes when you first want to make a comic. So this episode is about drafts, right? Do you want to tell me? You, you want to tell me what we what we decided? Does it, does it feel drafty in here to you? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So we had three seemingly uh, random ideas that we collected over the week, and uh, Tom and I had a preliminary chat right before this, and we we're, we're trying to figure out if if there are any links at all. And it seems like a lot of it uh, comes down to what you know and what you don't know uh, in the drafting phase before, during, and after. <laughs> What you know and what you don't know in the drafting phase. So this opens up a lot of questions, and this 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 actually came from our last episode, um, where we finished off talking about um, where that episode was focused on leaning into the worst, leaning into what we sort of wish we weren't, you know, leaning into the parts that are quote bad, and um, and we riffed on that with um, Rob from the community brought up a Dolly Parton quote where she said. Um, paraphrasing, um, find out who you are and then do it consciously. Um, and then we were, uh, what else were we doing from that? I wanted to bring up the King of Morocco. You want to hear about the King of Morocco? I, I know Leanne wants to know. <laughs> I, I lived in Morocco for about five months. It was, um, it, the King of, um, the king was a pretty strict king. I think he wasn't well liked. He he had too many, you know, too many rules and and probably wealth was flowing up too much and stuff like that. But by law, the king's um picture had to be in every single business. Every single business from like the tiniest newspaper shop. This was when we had newspapers in the world. Um and you know, and gum shop to the biggest restaurants and I'm presuming factories which I never really saw. So you your day-to-day -day activities would be going from like shop to shop or cafe or whatever, and you would just see pictures of the king over and over again. Usually they were the regal ones, but sometimes it was him playing golf. Um, and what happened was you got really used to the king so much that you kind of started to like him. And even I and so I had a chance. I didn't really have much to say about the king, but I had a chance to see his motorcade go by in the in the capital of Rabat, and I was really excited. <laughs> and he went by like this, whoosh, and I had about like two seconds maybe to see it. And I was like, oh my God. And my heart was racing. I was so excited because I had seen the king, his photo so many times. And then when he died, I spoke to some Moroccan friends 
and friends who I who who told me like, oh, I don't like the king. He's very, and they were crying. And they were like, it was my king. Like, and so the point is, is that we we I think these we we build attachments with familiarity. We build attachments with regularity, um, and those can be like the things in our art that are weird and that are wonky, you know. And the more the more you see it, the more you might be like, you know, I have a friend who is a really terrible letterer and I never really bring it up, <laughs> but I, it's kind of the point where like, if I saw their comment, is it me? <laughs> no, no, it's not you, Jess, you're the one, no. And, and, but I, but I, I don't bring it up and it got to the, it's getting to the point where like, if they did a comic and I didn't have that bad lettering, I'd be like, oh, I miss it. Anyway, so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, let, let your me. bad lettering be your brand. Yeah. So let <laughs> so let's start on the things that you brought to the table today. Um which were become more interested in doing what you're doing than knowing what you're doing. This quote from George Saunders and then um Well that's we, oh wait, wait. So this the first thing that Tom said is not the George Saunders quote, but we in, in addition to the thing that I thought of, we have a George Saunders quote which we will explain. Right. And then, so go, I want you to tell us about what we're talking about. What are we talking about? Uh, so last week, I I might have just been in a really good mood, but I had this thought hit me like lightning in the bathroom of all places. And I was like, where's the paper? I have to write this down. This is the best thought I've ever thought of. And the thought was, and later, a few days later, I was like, I don't know. I mean, it's pretty good, but I don't know if it's that great, but I was so... <laughs> It was nice to have a feeling like that where I just thought it was awesome. So the idea was become more interested in doing what you're doing than knowing what you're doing. Um, that felt like such a revelation in terms of a lot of the questions that we've been getting for the podcast and other places that I teach. It just seems like something that I had been subconsciously thinking about and manifested as this beautiful thought. Um, and then sort of related to that, I, I subscribe to George Saunders's Pod, uh, not podcast, uh, Substack. And that has a lot of advice on the writing life and how to be better at what you're doing. Very similar to what we're thinking about, but maybe more for prose than for comics. And um, there was a quote I pulled from that about the experience George had about making a first draft. And he described the first draft as being baggy, which I thought was really fabulous. It was like such a good visual um i'm trying to see if i have the quote handy tom do you have that uh george saunders quote um did you put it in the uh let's just say oh i often yeah i do it's in the chat right now it's the okay. one of it yep here it oh comes. fabulous okay okay so uh exactly uh, i often find myself writing long meandering first drafts that drift around a bit before settling down into a state of baffling indecision which also feels very relatable. Um, so really exciting that George Saunders was able to get a first draft down. That seems to be where I encounter a lot of resistance. But then once you get over that initial triumph, you look at it and you're like, now what? And that also becomes like a big space to, to ponder. Um, so sometimes the now what is like, what do I do next? But sometimes the now what is like, now what do I do now that I have to do this thing? and I don't feel equipped to do it. And that can uh, that can be more an obsession with knowing what you're doing versus doing what you're doing. It's like, just, just keep doing it. And then, I mean, I think there are um, nuances to this and there's also uh, counterpoints and counter arguments that say, you don't wanna, you don't wanna just willy nilly keep making stuff and, until you like kind of hit a wall or get really, really lost in the weeds. Um, but I do think if you have something made the work will tell you what it is. And I think Tom has a little faith in that idea too, that if you if you are lacking, what you lack in structure, you'll make up for an uh, award-winning personality <laughs> and marks on the page. Maybe, I feel like I have faith in this. I don't know. What do you think, Tom? Um, are we talking about after our, after our quote baggy first draft or are we talking about during the baggy first draft? It's probably before, during, and after. The courage to do it is, like, I'll just do it, and then I'll mm -hmm. figure it out. And then doing it, you're like, I'm doing it, and these concerns that I have are valid, but I'm kind of putting them aside. And then, phew, I did it. And now you're like, okay, I have to reckon with all of these 
doubts or questions or parameters or, or lack of structure or problems I ignored <laughs> the first time. Um, I think I think my answer, I, I think I'd like to pick it apart and off and and break it into variables um, because a, a, a small piece that's like six pages or something is bigger than is different than like a 200 page piece, right? Um, and how do those how do those drafts differ? You've got more familiarity with with shorter pieces. I think most of the pieces in your in your um, in in, in uh, your graphic novel were six eight pages, 12? 12, 12 pages, twelve right. chapters. Yep. Um, and I've done a little bit of all of that. So so I'd like to know, like, for we, we do have a lot of people here at Saw who come in with big ideas, and um, and we love those big ideas. But they're they they're sometimes hard to sort of like keep on a leash, um, and that's and that's that's the issue. So like if you can force yourself to do a, a quote baggy first draft of your big two hundred page graphic novel, that's great. But that's also a lot of work, right? So what is a what does that draft look like? But I'd like to maybe start with smaller pieces. When you're working, which you work in usually in nonfiction, what does a first draft look like for you? Um, it's gotten cleaner and cleaner, and it depends on who I'm collaborating with. When I when I interview people, it might start with a, a transcript that's really way too big. It's baggy in its uh, scope. It's too. It's got me talking and other people talking, and there's there's stuff in there that I don't necessarily need. The most recent piece we're working on the third comic for the Boston Globe, and my partner's been writing essays, and I somehow accidentally trained him how to make a comic script. So now he writes in comic script format like, like he'll even have sound effects and uh he'll write what colors certain things are he's like getting really creative so that's like uh really clear uh signposting on what i could do and at first i was like don't tell me what color this should be uh but also when you have really tight parameters you have all these other ideas that emerge from from a it's like having a little tiny window garden versus like a big wild field that you're like wow this is too big so scale can certainly impact what that first draft looks like, but even in small self-contained things that are being clearly edited by multiple people early on, um, I think I think my my doubts or resistance may be manifest as I hope this turns out okay. Just a vague sense of like, oh, I wonder, I wonder how this might work, and will there be an opportunity to do something that dazzles myself where I get really excited about it as as a as the since you're working in collaboration you're sort of off sourcing the, the first draft in some ways do you ever get the first draft and say this is utter garbage and unsalvageable and i can't work with this Take that's such a good question because i just got this first draft for this new piece yesterday and uh my husband and i are both terrible procrastinators so it's due on friday and he had to work and then and then he finished it and he sent it off and uh i i wasn't feeling well on wednesday or monday night and he was like do you want to read it and i was like ah just send it it's fine if you if you think it's good what could go wrong and i read it and he's actually included me as a character which we've never done before and i he had mentioned it like oh i'm thinking about doing that and the cat will be in it too i was like oh sounds cool um but to read it, to read us having dialogue in a comic, I was like, oh, I was like sort of startled to see myself like, oh, what are you doing here? <laughs> Me? <laughs> so there are, I think there's good surprises. You just certainly have to relinquish a little bit of control. But I think the older I get, the less uh, controlling I am. I, I think when I first started working with editors, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, every time someone had an edit, I was like, ah, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and the the context for the George Saunders quote is it's sort of a love letter to this editor, the editor of the Substack essays themselves. It's a really fun read. Um, I'm I'm an oaf. I don't actually pay for my subscription to George Saunders's Substack, so I, I get all the free content. So if I know about it, you can you can uh, get on there, subscribe for the free stuff, and enjoy it as well. I think I think George was given one of the sweetheart deals from Substack, so I don't think it's. it's yeah, he deal. George doesn't need my money. He's yeah. developing an opera for Cincinnati Opera or something. Oh, I didn't know that. That's wild. Yeah, for Lincoln and the Bardo. I'm like, really. I think it's going to be cool. It's a that's a novel about a bunch of ghosts. So, um, I want to ask though about um, about your graphic novel that you were in full control of when because uh, you did these in short pieces. A lot of those short pieces were revised 
later with the parameter that they had to be 12 pages. Can you talk a little bit about, about the drafting process of the first iterations and then even and then even the later iterations? Yeah, the first drafts. So it's good to have like some type of little deadline in mind. I found it was helpful. So if there was a comic book convention coming up, I might make a zine format of one of the stories. Or if there is a, a call for submissions for a newspaper or a magazine that was looking for comics, I, I would have a blurb and kind of think about what their parameters were, how many pages they had available. So it could vary between like six pages up to maybe 16 pages. I think one of the zines I did was 16 pages. So when I sat down to like in earnest structure the book now that I'd put it off for as long as possible, I was like, oh, well, this one's four pages and this one's 16. And I just envisioned myself, I had I had figured out I wanted the main four branches of the military. Sorry, Coast Guard. I didn't get to talk to anyone from the Coast Guard, but that would be Navy, Marines, Army, and Air Force. So that was majorly important. And I had interviewed a different number of people from each of the branches. So once I figured out who my main characters were, then I was like, well, what sounds impossible? And it sounds like 20 veterans sounded like too many. And then 16 pages per chapter sounded like too many. And Tom and I have a friend, Tim Kreider, who's an essayist. And he had recently come out with a book called I Wrote This Book Because I Love You. And it had 12 chapters. So I was like, I'll do 12. Tim did 12 and he's still alive. <laughs> so sometimes you just like look at what else is out there and it seems possible. So so just kind of figuring out 16 felt like Goldilocks it, I guess. 16 is too much. 12 feels good. 12 times 12 would give me a nice little spine on the bookshelf. That was also some vanity I was concerned about. Um, and then I thought sort of idealistically that there's a baby crying somewhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought I could just slap everything together into like a production file or or <laughs> hand it over to a really talented graphic designer. Here, I, it's all done. But uh, but I had to reformat things and expand stories and uh, edit certain things down. But that was sort of a blessing in that some of the editorial feedback I got that I didn't agree with or we didn't have room for certain things, I could I could really do whatever I wanted for the book version. Um, and it's sort of similar now, like the pieces I'm doing with my husband about the hospital, they're, they're about 40 panels, which I guess you could translate that into like six comic pages if I had to guess. Um, and like, I, th I think we could make a graphic novel, but I, I can't picture the chapters being six pages. That seems too small. So I'm curious what the bigger project might look like. Hmm. So you're still, you're still in, in other words, this is interesting because you do finished work that acts as a first draft, right? You know, in both cases, right? You've done these, you did these finished, uh, both mini comics and pieces in anthologies. And those wound up being first drafts for your graphic novel work. And you're saying the same thing about the, the work you've been doing in the hospital with your husband, that these might wind up being first drafts for a later, a later graphic novel or something. Yeah, which sounds like a lot of work, but it's an opportunity to be a good editor to yourself. And also, I, frankly, there's stuff that's like probably problematic for a newspaper to publish. But if it were presented as uh, maybe more of a graphic novel, there's there's like... It's less weird. Um, I don't know how to phrase that better, but yeah, you, you may have a little more creative freedom in publishing a comic versus like something for um, under the umbrella of a client, like a smaller piece. So, so, what's the current? You're working on a current project. What's that current project? Just tell us the parameters of it and how that's inspiring this draft. Oh, okay. So, I think broadly, it's about uh, someone who's working in critical care in the hospital. Um, the this doesn't sound very cheery, but the collapse of American healthcare, if you will, uh, or or just generally like what is it like to care for people and be compassionate in a system that sort of isn't very compassionate or there's a lot of shortcomings, and then also be human yourself and have to work twelve hour shifts and kind of come up against these impossible things and 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 how do you feel about that? Um, the piece we're working on right now is about death. <laughs> And I always say, I, I've like, when I finished the veteran book, I was like, I can't wait to get done with this nonfiction stuff and uh, 
draw some butts. I want to draw some butts and just have a good time and be silly. I've yet to do that, though there is like somewhat brief nudity in those like hospital gowns. The the back is open, so maybe I can <laughs> see butt drawing in there. But um, yeah, I haven't been able. <laughs> uh, yeah, when when my partner was drafting it, he's like, "This one's really, really serious, and it's not funny at all." And I was like, "Oh no!" <laughs> I thought I thought this was as far as we were gonna go. But it's funny because I'm a really big softy. Like I I don't like drawing gore or sad stuff or anything explicit. So it's been really funny. And I'm also really lazy. So I, I like to try to triangulate my way around stuff I don't want to do while I'm doing the thing I want to do is a weird internalized parameter that I find useful. That's wild. Um, I, but I want to get back. You you said you're doing a, a, you're doing a, a piece about caring for people in a system that isn't compassionate. Like that's a very broad idea. Are you saying that's the broader topic for all the short pieces you're doing? Or are you just saying that's the pe that's the yeah. next piece? That's the broader yeah. topic. Okay. Yeah, if so, I had to like summarize the all of it, I think that all of it's related to that. But there's, yeah. So that's a great, this is a great in uh, discussion point for like, you know, what is your idea? And it's it's like to say what you just said, which is like, well, it's it's about caring for people in a system that isn't compassionate. My first thought or or most creative people's first thought would be like, this is a 490 page book because it's going to cover all of the ideas about working in a system that's uncompassionate and trying to be caring and stuff, but you're not doing that, right? You're, you're tackling six pages at a time or whatever number of pages at a time. You're yeah. saying this particular one's about death. The last one was about, I don't know what, and you don't, I'm guessing you don't have like your next uh, 20 episodes outlined or anything. That's interesting. That's a good question, Tom. To a degree, when we first started working with uh, the Boston Globe, who's our primary uh, client where we're serializing the work and kind of testing it out. Um, we, and I say we, but mostly my partner wrote probably about eight or nine really brief paragraphs about pieces that he, basically mini pitches. What about this? Or what about this? And different, different scenarios and um, different points of entry. So I think they're all concerned about that, but maybe one is more about um, the eyes of a patient or one is more geared towards uh, the nurses aides and the the custodial workers or something like that so the main characters might shift a little bit uh, uh i'm also trying to think of like the topics basically the the overarching things seem to be that everything that those stories were related to was um set in the intensive care unit at a hospital and most of the stories were at like a smaller hospital. So there's certain um, parameters for those stories, um, but there's a little bit of wiggle room. I don't know if that answered the question very well, but we did we did kind of have like a, out of these 10 ideas, which are your favorite? And there we kind of ranked the first like five or so, and we've just been going through. And then when we get to a piece, get a piece finished, Pretty much right after we're like, what do we do next? Uh, and then we'll look at the list. And then as we're working on the pieces, my partner will have ideas for other things. Like they're they sort of uh, at oh, the delight and terror of making something as everything branches out. It's sort of like when you clean your bedroom and you find another pile, and you're like, well, I was working on laundry, but this is more like <laughs> papers. Like, do I want to switch mediums? So like, how focused do you want to stay? So kind of having a little bit of a shopping list or some reference point that's really big. You always have it, an idea folder or something. That's been really helpful to have something to go back to. And then as we're having ideas, we try to remember to write them down. That's a great place to bring up the quote you had earlier that we've already said, which is like, be aware of what you're doing and not what you think you're doing, right? So you have enough experience, I guess, with that, that you you knew not to get too over-invested in what you thought the idea was. And, and what the best ideas were, maybe this first list of eight or nine ideas, whatever. And so every time it's 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 time to sit down and do a new one, you know to revisit the, the idea, revisit the outline, revisit the, the the folder of ideas you have, right? Right. And if, uh, I mean, it, it is a collaborative process. So if I feel like we're getting a little bit into the weeds, I'm like, ultimately, what is this about? Or what are we trying to say? Or if we have a main point, is that in service to it? But the main point, I intentionally made it as broad as possible so that we could kind of do whatever we wanted. Uh, but also, yeah, like you said, maybe that would be a 500 page thing. But I know for me, I don't want to do 500 pages of that. So we'll do it until 
we get tired, I guess. Or we run through that list and it feels like all the main things that seem very, very important have at least been touched upon a little bit. This is sort of a sidebar, but it reminds me of sometimes, and again, we haven't talked about fiction yet. I want to talk about that in a minute. Um, but when you're when you're writing a piece of nonfiction or fiction, and you're in that you're in that phase where you're doing a lot of research, I've had people ask, "How do you know when you're done researching?" Or "How do you know when?" Yeah, let's let's stick it with researching. Um, and I found the answer to be that you know when you know when you start repeating yourself. Like this can be either in your draft where you just kind of are saying the same thing over and over again. It's like, okay, maybe it's time to put away this draft and move on to the second draft. But also in researching nonfiction is be like, oh, I'm, I'm discovering the same facts over again, or I'm, or I'm running into the same story outline again and again. Um, is there something to that? I, it was a bit of a digression. I don't want to get No, too I like that a lot. I'm so glad you brought up research because uh, we're working in the nonfiction class at SAW online and I was just thinking oh my gosh it's a four-week class which is terrible because every everyone that's in this class has like mountains of stuff they want to make uh so it's a good problem to have in that we we have such a limited time together so I'm, I'm hoping that'll push us all myself included to like oh we have a deadline we have to make something and then you make decisions so if the deadline is very help, helpful the terrible anvil of daily deadlines if, if you're that's the other reason I've cleverly outsourced this project to other people that are smarter than me and surrounding myself with smarter people. And then also they have a deadline. So I have to get it done. So I have a mountain of research that's batting its eyelashes at me that was like, come hither. I, you need to put all of this in your final product. And I'm like, I, I, I'm coming back for you. <laughs> but, uh, but we only have time for this, right? So it's your weekend bag version, or uh, like going in for the snakes, the, the class that Tom teaches, like, what would you say from the burning house fire of your story if you cleared your desk of all the research you've ever done and put it in a box and you have a blank table with one piece of paper and one pencil, what would you write on that piece of paper that's just has to be in there? It has to, has to, has to be in there. Um, and I think that's the, the research that climbs aboard for that very first draft or that first story. And then you can also tell yourself, well, I'm making multiple chapters or I'm making multiple zines or like let yourself Right. serialize a big crazy thing at least that's how I've worked and that's been really helpful because I, I know it's not the last chance that I don't have to put everything in there and one of the nicest things I feel like I say this a lot I just shared it again yesterday one of the nicest things a non-cartoonist or a person in general has ever said to me I was really stressed out about the graphic novel about the veterans and I was like I hope I get it right or what if I don't have enough stuff in there like I, I can't fit everything in here and she's like oh don't worry you're gonna make another comic after this and so I was really stunned because I hadn't even really published a zine at that point. And so I was really excited that she had that great faith in me, but just to zoom out a little bit, bit and think I could make more than one of these, but you're certainly not going to make even one if you kind of hold yourself hostage and, and say, oh, I have to do this or I have to do that. I think you have, have to do the wonky, short, weird, not good version and realize it's actually serviceable and a brick in a larger house. You have to start building the house. Awesome. Um, maybe we can maybe we can use this point as a point to make sure we've hit all the points. Point, 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 point. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. This wait, point wait. of the talk to make sure that we hit all the talking points we wanted to. Boy, I just can't not repeat myself. <laughs> and then maybe and I know maybe when you were like, asking about repetition earlier, and I'm not sure I answered it. You're like, what what if uh, the research comes up more than once? And you're like, point, 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 point. <laughs> um uh, what I mean is I think, I think maybe we're, maybe we've almost exhausted the idea about drafts and we can take some questions, but also make sure that we hit all the points that we sort of outlined earlier. Like I, I just wanted to quote this Neil Gaiman quote, and again, it's a paraphrase, but, but I remember him saying that the, the second draft is the chance for you to, um, to make it look like everything you did in the first draft you did on purpose. And I like that because it allows a lot of freedom in that first draft to make a mess, to not know how things happen. If you're writing fiction, it's, it's you know, I don't write fiction. I, I actually found that like, I mean, I do, but I don't write it right. right. I found that, um, this is a digression again, I'm sorry, but I found that like, it's very hard for me to make action happen in a first draft. 
And then I have to outline that first. If I just go down and write, no action happens. It's like, oh, a guy wakes up and gets a glass of milk and just sits and- I have the, the same window. problem, Tom. Yeah. Oh, that's so right. refreshing to hear. <laughs> but I know other writers actually, and I'm, I imagine Neil Gaiman's the kind of like suddenly in his brain, you know, a, a phantom appears and the character follows the phantom and then the phantom turns into a- into a robot, you know, stuff like that, but that would never, anyway, but that's, that's about, and I saw this in the chat, that's about sometimes having an outline that's serviceable, that you can, that you can work from and say, here's what I'm going to write about today. I'm going to get from the part where the character sees the phantom to where it turns into a robot, but also allow yourself the freedom to say, like, if that's a, a bad idea, I'll know while I'm writing, I'll learn that a better idea is, is, is coming when it comes, right? I'll know that a better idea is there. Yeah, I think a draft is just like your grocery list, like your shopping list. So it's good to have a list. But, you know, if you found asparagus on sale and that's what you want to put in your risotto, I'm not going to stop you. That's OK. Like you, you leave room for both. You have an itinerary and and a um, space for digression. Um, is there anything you missed? Because we do have actually quite a bit come up coming up in the chat. We did have the one question on YouTube from oh. Chris. Is it Kristen? Christina. <laughs> Christina. I knew being with a K. Uh, uh, so she's like, I, and she, I th thank you for listening. And uh, she said that she noticed us kind of repeating ourselves on the topic of repetition, saying, <laughs> uh, what if my uh, first draft is too weird? And she's like, what if my first draft is not weird enough? <laughs> Which I think is like, uh, ooh, the flip side of the sexy coin. Very interesting question. Right. Um and I think I, I think I said something like, and or at least, I, every story has the potential to not be boring, right? If it's boring, I'm not sure what that I'm not sure what that means, but it probably means you're telling the same story everybody else does. But I guarantee you, that's not really the story that is is waiting to come out or that can come out. And I think this goes back to the quote you had and the quote that I that I um, had from Hyena, which is that is like, pay attention to what you're really doing, pay attention to the, what that story really is and not what you think it is mm -hmm. and not what your experience in reading other people's stories tells you your story is. Um, How does that story. relate to, Tom, can I ask you when you were like, yeah. if I just write, if I tried to write the story on the page, like of writing fiction, the action doesn't happen. Are you like, is that related to it not being weird enough or not being it could weird could also be like not actiony enough like there could be a, another word there too right or you don't really care if it doesn't have any action in it i know we're supposed to care the 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 people that invented fiction said it's important to have action uh yeah i'm actually that question kind of threw me because i'm not sure i equate action with any like uh, to me that's just another thing that happens in a comic or or in a story and can, and it can be a lot or a little Mm -hmm. I tend to gravitate towards a lot, but that comes from years of of uh, paying attention to what what kind of stories move me and what part what what parts of my own stories when I'm telling them move me. And I wish, you know, looking back at my career, which is oh, now 20, 30 years ago, whoa, um, whoa. but no, there's so many there's so many parts where I realized like I made choices because it seemed like the choice that a typical comic w sh should make. And those was are the, that good or bad? Like to, bad. to okay, <laughs> it sounded yeah. bad. No, yeah. What I mean is, it's like I wish I had the courage early on to just to just say no over and over and over again to all the all the voices that said this is how this is what a comic looks like. This is what a comic sounds like. And luckily, you know, I think nowadays there's such a broad spectrum of types of comics that are out there, both visually and narratively, that it's much easier to find. To, to say no and then to point somewhere else and find the yes, you know, to have to find models that like, that are like, no, I think what I want to do is a little more like this. It's like, it's less that, it's more this and it has that. And there's somebody kind of doing something like it, but not quite. And I, I have a feeling like that I, that if I do something like that, that'll feel right. Um, so I didn't have that as much. And I was always, always, always victim to, uh, uh, just general expectations, which, you know, I always sort of, I always just sort of internalize them and I really regret it. 
Um, preach, um, preach. I love this. <laughs> so, was it preaching? We we have a lot of questions in the in the chat. Did we get to all the things? In our... I think those are the main things. So hopefully, <laughs> our digressions have answered our our three ideas related to first drafts. And uh, we're gonna look over in the chat, or because we're doing this live on a Zoom call, and see if there's some questions we can answer. I, I want to address Jim. Really... And Tom's gonna look. <laughs> I'm going to help. Yeah, we're gonna look at the chat, but I want to look address Jim really fast because he he's. He says, I've written a series about a man who spends most of the comic on his back. This is actually like that book was one of the first times I was like, I like dialogue. I don't like action. I'm just going to have a guy on his back. <laughs> so, Jim, thank you for noticing that. That, But that was like one of the first. And it took years for me to wrestle that idea out. But that um, that was me trying to not, quote, play to my strengths, but play to the, the real desires I had as a as a creator on the page. And it was really realizing, like, I really like dialogue, too, was part of it, even though I, I, anybody, I should have known. But sorry, what other questions do we have, Jess? Oh. <laughs> Maybe I have people to go backwards can... in time. I'm like, where I, I want to go all the way to the top to see what I missed, which is quite a lot of stuff. So I'm trying to figure out where well, you know, to... I can comment a, a little bit, you know. Part of what we were just talking about is something we talk about in the graphic novel group too, which is like we ask people to boil down their idea to like a real to a four-page comic. We also ask them to boil it down to one word. You boiled it down to a sentence. We also ask them to do that, which in your sentence was something about being a compassionate person in an uncompassionate system, which is good. And then maybe if you were to boil it down to one word, it might be like compassion or service or something like that. And that's another good way to like let that bagginess, like when it's baggy, what you do is you get rid of the things that aren't that aren't serving that main word, right? Or that same like that main idea. Unless you like baggy, but not everybody, yeah. You know, I mean, baggy is a good, I don't know. Sorry, I'm really digressing. So no, it's good you're buying me time while I catch up on all the comments. Oh. Uh, no, I don't know. It's funny. Sometimes we like we're in the conversation on a podcast, we label what we're saying as a major digression. But mm -hmm. I feel like we're um, playing in a stream of ideas or something, and it it, um, it feels related. I feel like when we look back on this, it will all make sense, right? Just like our comics. <laughs> Here's some things in the chat I wanted to I, I, that I was looking for, which was uh, Adrian and Donna and Leonie a little bit um, talking about. Well, first of all, they. Well, let me see. Adrian was asking, "How is it possible to quantify?" how a draft when it's still in its nebulous form that's when i was that's when i was asking you the question about like what if you, what do you do when you get a bad draft but you you sort of dodged that question and i think adrian's question is sort of the same which is like that's not a fair that's not a fair way to respond to a draft actually well it's funny yeah i think um it's that really silly like is the glass of water half full or half empty <laughs> like i feel like that's such a cliche but or <laughs> In real life, if you burned the cornbread and you take it out of the oven, how much of it is edible? <laughs> so <laughs> you cut off the burnt parts and you're like, this is pretty good. Like if it's edible, that's really that's that's something to go on. And how do we define edible? <laughs> how hungry are you? So maybe you're just hungry for like a really slightly crispy first draft. <laughs> maybe it's overcooked. But I, but I wonder, yeah, you just have to have something to go on. It doesn't have to be the beginning and end of everything, this draft. Let's go back to um, deadlines and constraints. A lot of people in the chat are talking about page limits, right? And especially when an anthology or something is asking for this many pages, that's a, that can be a great, great limit. That, that can be a great, um, you know, really help you with the creativity and the, and the decision making and all that stuff. Uh, Adrian was talking about sometimes it's about affordability. What can I print? You know, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, that's great too. Um, well, and and working with clients, they have a budget. You know, like uh, right. they they're happy to say as long as you want, but the budget's not getting any bigger. Right. <laughs> so right, right, right. I have to kind of be like, all right, just just we're gonna do two print pages and however yeah. long it takes up in the digital format too, and it can feel like the sky's the limit if you're not printing, if it is a digital thing, it's a vertical scrolling comment, comic, for example, um, there are less parameters on the length of it. Um, Kate's asking a question, particularly of me, so I will answer it. Um, yeah. I would like to hear from Tom about what it was like to create drafts for your graphic memoir. 
It is very different from what Jess did. She serialized it and had finished pieces published throughout the process. Did you do that or what was your drafting process like? Um, since it was nonfiction and since it was a metaphor and since it was largely chronological, there was already an outline. Um, there were a lot of flashbacks and sometimes I, sometimes those came to me while I was drafting, but I, but more often than not, actually that book sort of found its own structure in that a lot of the flashbacks were early on and then, and then the flashbacks and the present caught up to each other. And then they were pretty much just the present tense or the, the you know, I was telling it in the past, but <laughs> one, one timeline. Um, so I had, I had the outline and it was, and, and because it was also kind of a travelogue too, it was like, this is this section when, when we were in that part of New Mexico, this is that section when we were back in Florida, this is that section. Um, in the drafting, I didn't, I drafted one chapter at a time. Um, that was largely because I just can't think in big chunks. I, I, I have one friend, only one that I know of who, who, who drafts her entire graphic novel in writing and then drafts it in thumbnails and then pencils the whole thing and then inks the whole thing. That's Megan Kelso. I think she's crazy. <laughs> I did crazy. that once and I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah, no, I did it once too, actually. And I don't recommend it. This in, um, so for the, for the memoir, I did one chapter at a time. Um, uh, yeah, in that, in that order. So, you know, thumbnails, pencils, inks, and then I moved on to another chapter. And if things needed to change, uh, like if for some reason something be in the in the earlier stages would have to change, I would be comfortable doing that. But because it wasn't fiction and I wasn't making it up, there wasn't a lot of that. Um, so yeah, that's really really just how that happened. It was actually pretty pretty traditional, just one chapter at a time. And and within those chapters, I'd like to point out Tom has this really gorgeous binder, uh, a video of it somewhere <laughs> where he shows the first draft of Rosalie Lightning and. There were at one point pages that were just like tofu question mark <laughs> and then moving yeah. along and then and there were pages that were detailed or thumbnails or maybe even fancier than that like really specific drawings but a lot of the pages just started out as notes to self like I know that this goes here or I will want this to be included and this might be where to put it in and it was a three ring binder where Tom could move things around I've seen um uh, Lauren Weinstein also worked that way with a longer uh, graphic memoir. Like if you just have like uh, mobility within the pieces, I think that can also feel like uh, less constricting within the parameters too. Yeah, um, it should also be pointed out, and this is related to everything we've been talking about, that that draft had the potential to be like 700 pages or something if I wanted it to be. The, 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 the incidents, and thoughts and reflections and other things that could have gone into that story were enormous. And eventually I had to edit out and I edited it out based on what seemed relevant to the, the main idea, like you were talking about. And the main idea was that there, there was a path to healing and a path to recognizing Rosalie in this new state. That was pretty much the main idea. And if it didn't serve that, it wasn't, I took it out. The first instance that happened to me was like, I realized because I was doing a memoir about something that hurt, um, I thought it was my job to make everyone else hurt. <laughs> it sounds funny now, but it certainly felt real at the time. Like I was writing these, these um, ugly, scary, traumatic parts that I thought would be effective because they would get across how ugly and scary and traumatic certain things were. And then I realized like that, that wasn't what the kind of book I wanted to create. Um, this, and then, and then I had to ask myself, well, what kind of book am I creating? And that's when that, that idea sort of came to me. It's like, this is about trying to figure out the, the path to recognizing Rosalie having a new role and um, and then and then so that helped me edit in and out and things like that. And then it just took the shape that it did. Um, so yeah, uh, I didn't have other 
I did I did serialize it as mini comics because I love mini comics and yeah. I know and I know that putting them out there in like 24 pages or whatever, those chunks will be um satisfying to me. And even if like seven or eight people see it or something, that the people that do see it will some amount of energy will be reflected back towards me and that energy I'll use to keep going. Um and I think so I think I did three or four issues of the mini comic before I started like showing it around and stuff like that. All so. right. I put it all in the chat. You're <laughs> <laughs> paraphrasing the beautiful things you said. That's so awesome. Yeah. So I think there's a lot to be said for having an idea or a major point that that you want to serve. And so all the other things fall under it. And that could look like a lot of different things. And then having parameters like it's not going to fit in the binder. <laughs> Um, and then um, serializing it as well. Like I, I, I can take pieces of this and give it to my friends and have that energy reflected back at me, so I can keep going. Because long <laughs> stuff, comics are hard, but the like long comics, you're like, this is so hard. That's great. Thanks for sharing that, Tom. We're at like the around the forty five minute mark. Should we? Yeah. So let's like let's take down. last question. Scour the chat one last time. If you got a last question, we'll take it, and otherwise we'll we'll wrap up. Thank you, Kate, for asking that question and for, for listening. Um, uh, I think we addressed some of what, uh, again, Donna and, um, and Adrian were talking about page counts and those kinds of parameters. Yeah, and there was a question early on about like developing a space, like a physical space or a structure oh. for your work. Um, and I think we'd like to make that into a bigger call. So maybe for episode four, particularly those that... Uh, have ADHD or different types of um, neural activity, <laughs> uh, and they and they are curious about like how to build a beautiful place to to make the work within, not just a binder, but a. Yeah. Well, it's funny because Tom has a gorgeous desk that he doesn't sit at. He sits cross-legged on the floor, <laughs> which is probably good for his hamstrings. <laughs> I, is it? Oh, I threw that desk away when I, I got rid of the desk and I bought a piano because I was like, I don't sit at this. no, seriously, I was like, I don't sit at this thing. Anyway, yeah, let's talk about that. I wrote it in the chat. Next issue I wrote. And even though I yeah, didn't how to build a space to work in a dream castle. We'll talk about dream castles. A dream castle. Oh, my God. You are amazing. All right. I think we're wrapping it up. If there are any last questions, now's the time to put it in the chat. Otherwise, um, Jess, There's it's always episode four. Let's procrastinate. <laughs> well, I also want to, you know, in transparency, again, I want to bring up the fact that Jess is working on a book called The Bootlegger's Guide to Comics. And we're working through a lot of these ideas to get, to get, uh, to bring her closer to that book. Um, so this section, what section are we, I don't know. You want to tell us about that book? <laughs> oh, yeah, really quickly. So, yeah, uh, okay. so this is the other thing. If you can uh, out, like, kind of outsource your deadlines, Tom has said, you should make this book. I was like, yeah, good idea. And he was like, we need it by just arbitrary, like, June 1st or something. I was like, oh, sure. June yeah. is so long away. Now it's February already. Oh, my God. And I promised this, like, a couple weeks ago. So I, I've been just making wild promises to Tom, who I'm calling my editor, and he refuses to wear the editor hat. But He's, he's basically just in the Google document being like, this is great. So it's everything you want in an editor, nothing that you don't. But having a deadline, having someone to impress. I told Tom last week, I think by Friday, I'm going to post the structure of the book, kind of the loose table of contents in the flow group on the Saw Mighty Network. And I didn't do it because I'm a terrible procrastinator. But I knew I had told Tom I would. So I was like, I got to do this. And then, uh, and then I started drafting it like crazy. And a lot of it's based on stuff I'd already written on the Saw Network as blog posts, or it's appeared in our sub stack. But hey, we love recycling. So I threw it all together. And um, I, I probably shared it sooner than I, I needed to. But I was like, Tom, I have a Google Drive doc. It's so fancy. Do you want to look at it? I'd figured out how to make like hyperlinks for chapter headers and was feeling really smug. And Tom was like, is this all there is? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I panicked. And I immediately started putting a bunch of stuff in the uh, the the document. So I think if you have an editor that's uh, very, uh, you know, has a, a flattering streak, but also is like, hey, where is this stuff? I don't know if you can find someone like Tom. I'll I, help you get the book done. <laughs> I put in the chat a note to myself as editor to act, act more unimpressed. I know I'm probably the least helpful uh, faculty member at SAW because I just show up at the end. I'm like, this is so great. And I genuinely mean it. But a lot of people who want some like constructive criticism are, uh, find me lacking. So anyway, Tom's your guy. 
<laughs> He'll tell you what the problem is. Um, okay, well let's let's call this let's call this episode three. Um, thanks to everybody who is here live. Thanks to everybody who is listening. Next episode might be about the Dream Castle. It might also we're not really exactly sure, but it'll be one step past thinking about drafts, which I think we did an okay job on this time. And also Jess's book in, is also chronological about how to make comics. So it starts with like, who am I? <laughs> and then, it goes and then, from vague, uh, like uh, like existential terror into lettering. So we're really hoping to get to some brass tack stuff right. like and layout. Right. And we really want to try to help you with the some of the less scary stuff, but I guess we're starting off a little heavy, but. Vague existential terror to <laughs> chapter one. <laughs> so, as always, Jess, I'll share, this, <laughs> uh, I'll share this chat with you, and you can write a recap of this and put it into your book. Yay. And slowly, by the by, the terrible deadline, the terrible anvil, this book will get made. And we really appreciate everybody being here and, and listening in as we have this conversation. Yeah, thank you. We will have a terrible party. <laughs> totally. <laughs> All, All right, right Jeff. I'll talk to you next thanks time. Bye. Okay, Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. This has been a production of the Sequential Artists Workshop, or SAW. You can find us on social media at Comics Workshop and online at sawcomics.org. You can hear about our many courses at learn.sawcomics.org. SAW is a nonprofit and supported by people like you. Learn how to make a tax deductible donation at the donate page of sawcomics.org. You can join our free community of comics explorers at members.sawcomics.org. Thanks so much for being here.